Hi Argentinian friends, hi all small talk friends. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Boris Shingarov, I work at Labware. My job is to invent the small talk of the future. Uh, the first lesson that became crystal clear along this journey was that it's not really possible to make any real difference uh, just working on programming languages unless you also participate in the definition of what the computer of the future is going to look like. And uh, if you take and uh, look at the drastic difference between a typical computer of the 70s and what people are working on today, and how people compute now, uh, that drastic change is pretty scary. In the 20th century, when one says computer, you could be pretty sure they mean this typical 1970s general purpose machine working by effect on memory, where things are structs in that memory. It's sequential, it's deterministic, it has this Newtonian, Boolean idea of well-defined state. In this century, computer structures are a lot more diverse, not just one effectful RAM. To take an example, even without leaving small talk, for example, in Silicon Squeak, an object could be something like that bunch of transistors over there instead of 20 bytes starting at this address. Machines are parallel, computation is non-deterministic, and this classical idea that there is an objective truth about the state is simply not there anymore. Okay, a lot of people are gonna at this point say yeah, but Boris, but you are talking about some hazy quantum future. It's not. We are slow to realize it, but it's stuff in production today. Let me show you a few astonishingly simple examples. Here is some rather trivial C program. All it does is some elementary integer arithmetic and returns a result code. Uh, you probably would expect some of that state to get optimized away, like this unused variable here. But if you give GCC the minus G flag, or even better, minus G GDB, you might expect to be able to see at least something. Uh, let's try. Breakpoint in F. And you cannot see anything. You cannot break, you cannot step. Uh, let's look at the binary. This is open power. You see it just loads the lowest 16 bits of the register and returns. So GCC only preserved the observable I.O but there is no talking about going from state to state to state. Another example is instruction level parallelism in pipeline processors. A deeply pipeline processor may be executing dozens and dozens instructions in flight. So the architected storage base does not really tell you anything about the actual physical registers in the processor. And if you want to have a program order view of what's going on, you may want to assert a debug interrupt request. That's like a quantum act of measurement. To stabilize, the pipeline gets drained, and now you are in a particular state. Here's another example, caches in SMP multiprocessors. They're not necessarily consistent. So people whose job is to fight race conditions 
end up writing dissertations like this. Aha! Here is the example I am sure by this stage you are holding your breath for. Quanta! Electrons and other things simply don't have well-defined trajectories. So you see, around the turn of this century, we started to gradually get used to the idea that all these examples are just facets of the same, much deeper phenomenon. Now, why did I use the word scary? Scary because small tokaiti holds you hostage to this left half of the picture. It does it in two major ways. One is, there are untold assumptions scattered all throughout the system. And two is that the system is designed in such a way that I cannot afford to break my toys. Now, this second problem, the debugging problem, Jan and I have been showing our solution in many different presentations. So if you are interested, we refer to those. The point is that now that that ULD debugger works, and I finally can afford to break my toys, how do I now build a system that does not force those untold assumptions on me? The archetypal example would be collect. In small talk, or shall I say Alan K like small talk, you have a bunch of objects, each of them is an actor or some kind of computational entity, perhaps biologically inspired, and each goes through a block as part of its life. Right? But this is not the narrative in small talk atia, even in the nice ones. The story we are reading instead talks about a backing array and a processor, and we take the first element of the array, and we evaluate the block, and we hold the processor up until we are done. And then we turn to the second element, and then to the third, and so on. I mean, for sure, without a doubt, I've got to implement collect somehow. I do get that. My problem is that I have expressed implementation details about one machine in a non-portable way, and now I am trying to sell that story as the definition of what collect means. It's not. Or, well, it is provided this computer is the only imaginable computer, which we implicitly assume as some kind of universal categorical imperative. Uh, let's think. Maybe there is still a hope to express collect. Okay, so let's build a computer to do something useful. Say, compute pi. We all know what pi is. And the thing is that there is many, many ways to compute pi. These algorithms, they even work on different principles. So these computers are going to be very dissimilar. OK, so let's draw our computer. It's a mystical box that is welded shut. You cannot see inside. Uh, but it has a button that you can press. OK, let's press the button. Poof! Smoke. You cannot see anything. You cannot understand what's going on. After the smoke clears, we see we have two things. The digit 3 and another box, just like the first one. Actually, because of the smoke, there isn't even any way to tell, is it the same box or is it a new box? Uh, there isn't much else we can do with a new box other than to press the button. So let's do that and poof! Smoke again. And we have now a digit 1 
and another box again. And uh, we push the button again and we have the digit 4 and yet another box. And we can keep doing this as long as we want and we're gonna be getting more and more digits of pi. And by the way, this picture here is called a coalgebra. There are two characteristic things to notice here. One is that this uh, rounded corner thingy here has two parts. The observable result, this uh, 3, 1, 4, and also this mysterious box, which we call state. And that's the part that's not observable. The highly characteristic thing number two is that this thing is recursive with regards to the box. So you can repeat infinitely many times. Okay, so far so good. So we drew one computer to calculate pi. Uh, how about another one? As we already know, there are many, many algorithms for calculating pi. So these red boxes are going to be completely different from the blue ones. What is the same is that when you press the button, the observable output is going to be the same. Here is another word to scare you. When two coalgebras have different inner state, but are observationally indistinguishable, they are called bisimilar. So maybe this blue one is a small talk interpreter executing some bytecode producing pi, and the red one is some highly optimized RISC-V native code. So these two are bisimilar to each other. Okay, so far so good. Uh, let me show you some magical device, which we're gonna call an optimizing compiler. What it does is uh, you put a blue coalgebra in here, like so, and uh, out comes a red coalgebra, by similar to the blue one. Obviously, as we already said, you cannot see inside the box, but what is guaranteed is that the I.O. is going to be the same. In uh, part two, in the afternoon, Jan is going to show you what's inside the meat grinder. But before we are ready for that, let's talk about some more basic concepts. Types. Most quote-unquote normal programmers, when they hear the word types, usually they imagine something along the lines of int, char, string, something like that. Some folks who are more computer science inclined, maybe talking about compound types, like doing algebraic operations over types, uh, talking about a list of A's, uh, product types, uh, exponent types, and so on. We small talkers are not particularly crazy about this. We do have some especially nice types, like the infinite precision integers. Our collections are an especially nice part of small talk. But in general, we don't bother with things like type inference, and we're generally content just saying uh, we're at dynamic runtime, uh, static types are boring and useless. So let's take a closer look at why. In one previous FAST meeting, we were talking about this guy who implemented addition as return 7. And from a TDD perspective, he is perfectly right. 
I start with a test checking that 3 plus 4 is 7. Code coverage of the test is 100% and the test passes. What's not to like? Well, now some customer is complaining that 42 plus 1 is 7. All right, let's uh, write another test and uh, fix our plus. Is this really better? Why not? Okay, maybe another, a simpler example. Increment. Increment goes from integer to integer. And we write a test that increment 1 is 2. Then when somebody complains that increment 42 is still 2, we write another test. So now increment 42 is 43. Okay, happy. <clears throat> I guess test coverage doesn't really help. Let's see if types can help. Let's get serious for a moment and look at this one that uh, hopefully better. And uh, is it any different than the other two? So let's see. Well, the type of this one is from Zahlen to Zahlen, and uh, this guy is Zahlen to Zahlen as well, and the other one too. So wait a sec, they're all the same. The home set Zahlen to Zahlen is just a bunch of opaque arrows with no way to discern which one is which let alone which one is good, which one is bad. <sighs> so it looks like this uh, flat set theoretic view is useless. Okay, is this the best we can do? Can we do any better? Let me, let me try something else. In Smalltalk, I'm gonna take my integer type and send it this message bar, pronounced such as. Well, syntactically it's a binary message, so it takes an argument. And for the argument, I am gonna give it a block, which will take an integer element and return whether it's good or bad. So it's a subset. For example, here I constructed the type of all integers greater than five. And it behaves kind of like a set. For example, you can send it includes to test whether something belongs or not. One is not greater than five. but 10 is greater than 5, so it is in the subset. And obviously you can do all the normal set theoretic stuff with this. You can do union, intersection, If it happens to be something finite, you can ask for all elements. You can test for inclusion. And so on and so on. It's all implemented by a reduction to SMT tautologies. Now, what does it have to do with uh, these guys we were talking about? Uh, the idea is that just like fractions subsume integers, these refinements subsume values. That is, just like we identify 2 
and six thirds, we identify 42 and all integers x such that x equals 42. Now our function increment is a family of functions which uh, taken together are components of a natural transformation. And now I'm gonna combine these countably many lines into one by replacing this one, two, three with A. And this here like so. And obviously this works for every A. So you see, now the arrows are telling me everything about what the function does. And it's a textbook algorithm to check whether the term or the body of the function does indeed belong in this type by reducing to an SMT tautology. Well, this one might seem trivial because all the SMT solver does in this case is just check that a plus one equals a plus one. But it turns out that it covers arbitrarily complex computations and crucially all the non-deterministic ones we were talking about before. So this picture here is a categorical picture where the arrows are telling you everything as opposed to this picture here where your computer starts in a state and transitions into another state and then transitions into another state and this just loops forever. So unless you are somehow looking inside the arrow, nothing interesting is happening. We already seen it. These two pictures turn out to be exactly the same phenomenon. Why is this crucially important? Why do we talk about this co-algebras and bisimilarity? Can it just simply say, well, this bytecode versus this optimized RISC-V code? Why do we need addition and plus and talk about three plus four if the actual problem is Mary had three apples and mom gave her another four. How many apples does Mary have now? Let's pause for a moment and think. The first thing that comes to mind is reuse. Tomorrow, Alice has three apples and uh, Bob gives her another four. Do they have to pay for that R&D all over again from scratch? See, even if, say, 10 years ago, Mary and Mom published their calculations, uh, for Alice and Bob to reuse that is questionable because, well, Bob isn't Alice's mother, and, by the way, um, in that paper 10 years ago, it says that those were large apples and uh, these uh, we have, these are much smaller apples and so on and so on. So, in this setting, building on the work of others is nonsensical. Okay, that was one reason to invent plus. There is an even more serious one. Noise. Uh, noise from complexity. Trying to solve a particular instance of a problem, as opposed to a, the problem in full generality, uh, those circumstances of the particular instance can introduce so much noise uh, that if the problem is difficult, you may not be able to solve it at all. Uh, does the name uh, Mary matter? Does the size of the apple matter? 
uh, does uh, and so on and so on and so on. There are so many screaming, fighting thoughts that it completely obscures, it blocks uh, any um, useful signal. And uh, what you need is language and notation to be able to uh, block out the noise and filter out the signal. Here is a famous paper from the creator of APL. The idea is that language and notation is much more than a vehicle for communication. It defines the horizons of thought. It defines what ideas are thinkable. And when notation is established, it does the thinking for us. There was a uh, great talk by Jan Piumarta here in Kilmes in 2011. If you haven't seen it, I full-heartedly recommend you watch it. I particularly like the part about Very Maxwell's opposition. Trying to find a similar case, and if they found one that was judged a certain way, uh, that's a precedent that says, aha, so your case must be the same. Um, but if you print all of these out, it comes to three cubic miles of paper, and that's probably more than any one person can keep inside their head. Um, uh, conversely, well, that applies to the United States, but something else that applies to the whole universe, to everybody, is electromagnetic phenomenon. So the thing that keeps me illuminated here, the thing that makes this microphone work, uh, when you switch on the television, when you boil a kettle, etc., etc., four tiny equations um, are the entire program necessary for electromagnetism. We'll come back. Yeah, that is just so totally awesome, awesome. And at the same time, I think Maxwell would envy our modern categorical notation that subsumes all computational phenomena, deterministic and non-deterministic, subsumes quantum mechanics, reconciles relativity with quanta, and so on. Okay, that's all very good. Now let's talk about something of a diametrically opposite character. Being able to add numbers in full generality is perfect. How does it help Mary count her apples? How do I build a practical small talk with this formalism? Here is one example. We take an AOTable modular small talk, something along the lines of mod talk B. Pocho's new power lang, you name it. Up to bytecode, it's standard front end. Then we transform it into Testarossa IL. We take a Plotkin style small step semantics for the trill and for the target processors like a Risk V. And here is my ahead of time compiled small talk kernel. Tonight, Jan is gonna show that in detail. Great. Great. Am I totally happy? You see, the problem is, this stuff I am feeding in here is still this. So even though native RISC-V and all those nice things, at a fundamental level, I am still trapped here. What I need instead is something like, okay, a block takes me from A to B, the functor collect lifts A to B to collection of A's to collection of B's, and if I add to that a naturality condition, that defines collect unambiguously. Now in small talk this becomes more complicated, because legacy code might have blocks with side effects, and that means races between the parallel actors. It's not like we don't know how to deal with it, but nevertheless, that is gonna be a lot of work. And uh, most importantly, it's deeply blended with the work that the global open source community 
is doing on defining the computational platform of the future. What is my main message with all of this? Especially to the students. Come join our journey. It's much easier now than it was a few years ago. So yeah, come join. If you are into that kind of adventure, which is inventing the future.